Welcome, welcome, folksy folks. Welcome to Fabric of Folklore podcast. I am Vanessa Y. Rogers, your hostess, and this is a show about discovery, a discovery of our legends, our stories, our traditions. For instance, Day of the Dead is a tradition that's quickly approaching, and it is celebrated in much of North and Central America. Marigolds are used in the Day of the Dead celebrations to decorate altars or ofrendas to honor the deceased loved ones. Their bright orange, yellowish hue and strong musky scent were thought to help guide the spirits of the dead home. The tradition of using marigolds for Dia de los Muertos dates back, dates back to Pre-Hispanic Aztec rituals, the Aztecs or the Nahua people believed that death was an inevitable part of life and that souls went to the land of the dead after death. Marigolds have also been used in local me medicines for hundreds of years, including remedies for fevers, colds, and digestive problems. Understanding why it is we have the traditions we do helps us to connect us to our past and to our present. And that is really what this podcast is about. It's about being a bridge of understanding and discovery. So if that sounds like a podcast you want to continue to listen to, hit that subscribe button, whether you're watching on YouTube with your eyes or you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform like Spotify or Apple or iHeartRadio, uh, hit that subscribe button so you get notifications every week when our podcast drops. We have a very Halloweeny episode for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about superstitions with Dr. McElroy. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture and a Master of Science in Environmental Resources and has been a professional editor and writer for 10 years. She's the author of several books, including the book we'll be discussing today, uh, Superstitions, a Handbook of Folklore, Myths, and Legends, from around the world. Thank you so much for joining us, Deborah. Thank you, Vanessa. Glad to be here. So I always like to start with asking a question about your journey. How did you get started on this journey of writing a book about superstitions? You know, it's, it's funny in that I've always been interested in folklore and legends and that kind of thing, but I was actually at the time I was writing uh, reference books. So I was writing things like books of symbols and so, you know, signs of the world and mm. silly things like that. And, um, and it, it was really just taking a lot out of me because of the amount of research and stuff that you have to do for reference mm -hmm. books. It's mm -hmm. just very intense. But my editor came to me after I'd written a couple of these and uh, he said, hey, we really want you to do a book on superstitions. And the first thing that went, went through my mind was no way I can't do it. You know, I was I was just getting the finishing touches up on the big uh, signs and symbols book that I was writing for them. And I'm like, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I need a break. And he cajoled me. I'm going to say that in a kind way. He cajoled me and, and they made a good offer. And, um, and I actually, I fell for the subject matter really. Mm. Otherwise I would have, I would have stuck to my guns and told him no, but, um, <laughs> but I was, I was intrigued by, you know, okay, what do superstitions look like around the world? Yeah. And I was left um by them to craft craft this book in whatever manner i saw fit so um i decided that because i had a really broad interest in um worldwide superstitions and and traditions that that's how i would set the book up i would do it uh by nations by by essentially by continents because there was too many nations of the world you know i couldn't break mm. it down into just the united states or just britain and that kind of thing and have a, a book under a thousand pages you know mm -hmm. so so i i stuck to continents and then i cherry picked just basically what i could find and what i was interested in um so the book may not necessarily have 
other people's ideas of the most critical, you mm -hmm. know, or the most crucial samples of of superstitions in particular places, but it was what I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So it has and what you had access to exactly what 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 I could find because this was right before COVID hit. Of course, that I was writing this book, mm -hmm. and so a lot of of my ability to go out and do research was pretty much shut down. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of online stuff. There were phone calls that were made. There were TV shows that were watched. There were, you know, that sort of uh, recorded media that was available mm -hmm. to me. But I wanted the book to have a tone that was lighter, particularly mm -hmm. given that I had just written this monster of a, of a reference book. <laughs> I wanted this book. It's 192 pages, so it's not super long. Mm -hmm. but it has just, it's the kind of light, happy thing that you could, you could pick one little paragraph out of it and drop it at a cocktail party, you know, <laughs> and say, Hey, yeah. did you know that in Japan, people are, are think that electric fans are bad luck, you know, or th that kind of thing. Um, right. Things that, that are just fun that made people, think of something other than what was going on in the world, you know? <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that doing that type of research would be difficult, especially during the time of COVID. Um, but in, in general, you know, the language barriers as well is is a, a trial because in, you know, there are some countries in Africa that have English as its um, primary language, but then there are lots of other places that don't speak English. So are you able, were you able to at all, like, get into those types of research? Or did you primarily focus on places that had some English uh, sources or English as its roots? Because of the way that COVID was affecting us all, it was pretty much impossible for me to um, do research in, with groups that didn't have, speak English. Mm -hmm. My my foreign language ability is practically zero. You know, I have, I can say, I could say, you know, I'd like a beer, please, in, in Spanish. But, <laughs> but, you know, obviously that's not the kind of foreign language that needs English help. There are mm -hmm. others that I don't speak. And I had no access to people who did, you yeah. know. So the book is exclusively based on English representations of what might be going on and what is going on in other countries. That mm -hmm. said, a majority of the countries of the world now have English as at least one of their major languages. You know, it may not mm -hmm. be the official language of the country, but people there speak it to a certain extent. That's mm -hmm. just the way it is, you know. So so I would say I didn't really have a lot of trouble language-wise. That wasn't where the barriers were. The barriers were there were some behavioral barriers, and then there were the um the ability just the ability to go out and meet people, mm -hmm. you know, our lack of ability to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So what country or continent did you find most interesting when you were researching? Well, I don't know if you'll find this surprising or not, but actually it turned out to be Russia. Mm. And um, I don't have any, you know, Russian family members or anything like that. But for me, as a military kid growing up during the Cold War, mm -hmm. Russia was, you know, this empty spot, this big mystery. And there was kind of a bit of a threat you know, the unknown threat, especially as a military child, you know, what are we going to be going to war with these people at any time? And without getting overtly political, it was just a big unknown mm -hmm. uh, for me and for my generation um, growing up. And, and uh, what we knew was, was pretty much only prop propaganda from right. both sides, from their <laughs> side and from, from our side. So as I started getting into the research, I discovered that what used to be the USSR and is now Russia um, has an extremely rich background and, and historical 
folklore tradition. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different characters. There are different creatures. It's very, very colorful in a physical sense and an emotional sense. There's a lot of meaning attached to the stories and what they mean. Um, it's very earth-based and um, that this so that, that leads most of their folklore to be pagan, although there is, you know, there's some that has, has gone on since. Then that's true in all, almost all Christian countries, at least, you know, in the U.S., no exception. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the folklore that is pre-Christian is just really interesting to me personally, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I, not that anybody may care, but I was raised Catholic, so I have nothing against religion. You know, I don't have an ax to grind or anything like that. <laughs> um, I do, I just seem to find that, that things that were pushed aside to make room for, um, a Christian tradition, um, were unique in Russia, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not that the same didn't happen elsewhere, but just right. some of the, the, the creatures and, and the P and the, I keep saying creatures because they have a number of unique cryptozoological type creatures and spirits and fairies and, um, um, household brownies and all different kinds of <laughs> little things that, that live with you and, and help you on a daily mm -hmm. basis if you're a, if you're culturally Russian. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just thought it was fascinating. I really yeah. did. There's a series of books. Um, I think they're in, the woman's name is. I'm gonna screw it up. Catherine. It might be Catherine Ahern. Um, oh, it, and there. I think it, I just read those. All three of them are take place in Russia, and the main character is a Russian witch. And she, she interacts with all these little creatures of the forest and of the household spirits and all of these things. And that particular series is a perfect illustration of the kind of cultural folklore and heritage that, um, that goes on in Russia that they have to draw from. I just thought yeah, it was the, wonderful. The series is called the Winter Night Trilogy. Is that the one you're talking about with Catherine Arden? That's it. That's yeah. it. Thank you for looking and that up. I just finished that series and it's beautifully written. So I highly recommend anyone who is interested in Russian folklore at all to read it. Um, the first book, if you're looking, if you're interested, is The Bear and the Nightingale. But it's it's a lovely series. I, it I really is. That one. Yeah. Yeah. It made a huge impression on me. And I read it over the course of writing my book so i read one before and one during and one after you know um as time allowed but what she did some some of the things that went on in her book is that she would raise a question for me you know mm. not that not that i was that i disagreed with her i just thought ooh, what's i need to know more yeah and so then i would run to the research to see okay tell me more about the doma boy <laughs> Tell me more yeah. about the Rizalka, you know, tell me more about these different creatures and these different beings and what they mean in Russian folklore. And it was all just marvelous. It was just mm -hmm. wonderful. So tell us a little bit about who this, your book, the handbook, Superstitions Handbook is intended for. Who's the target audience? I, I'm imagining someone who's like traveling around and like looking up superstitions while they're in like a specific area. But who, who do you, in your mind is reading this? I don't see it as a travel book specifically mm -hmm. because um, the, what it has on, on each characters in each country due to space is rather limited. Mm -hmm. So I think that people who are, are using travel logs are going to want a book that gives them more for what they have to carry. Okay. Um, this book has some little illustrations in it. It's got, you know, page borders, it's got breaks, it's got, you know, it's, it's more about beauty and yeah. aesthetic than it is about, just an info dump, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that, that the reader for this book is someone who 
has an interest in folklore, but they don't know what they want. Mm. They haven't been exposed to very much. So they kind of want like um, a, 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 an appetizer, mm. you know, for folklore. And they're, b- before they sit down to eat this smorgasbord, <laughs> you know, let's, let's see what's out there. You yes. know, here's, here's a little bit about Russia. Here's a little bit about Africa. Here's a little bit about the Middle East, you know. Um, all these different divisions and, and continents that I was able to squeeze in there. Um, you, there's a little bit enough to make somebody decide, oh, I want to do more like I did on the, on the Russian dive, you know, mm-hmm. but there are plenty of, of other materials in there. If you're a fan of Asia, if you're a fan of, of Australia, you know, talk about some place that's remote that most of us have no idea, uh, what that's like. Um, mm-hmm. there's stuff in there from Australia and the Pacific islands. Mm -hmm. so it's i definitely think of it more as a a tasting plate than i do um a reference book Mm -hmm. and i love the illustrations um there's an illustration before each continent Uh, Mm -hmm. what were those uh, were they specifically for those continents for us can you can you talk to us a little about those um the the book was was absolutely stunningly designed by Quarto Publishing, who's my publisher. And I can't say enough good things about them because they just do a beautiful job. I I want to carry this book around and show it to people just because <laughs> it's beautiful, you know? It is. I love the colors as well. The color and the gold foil on the cover. And, and as you mentioned, the illustrations that every uh, different section has a major illustration. And then throughout there are are minor illustrations to go with, you know, some of the goddesses and, or some of the monsters or some of the uh, different folklore creatures or little um, like just page decorations and things. Mm -hmm. So it really is a giftable item. Um, It's, it's a book that I think anyone would be proud to own. You know, it's not going to wind up hidden on a shelf. It's going to be out on the coffee table. Right. Um, with your other coffee table books, probably on top because it's a smaller size. You know? <laughs> um, now, when you were writing this book, did you get a sense of where superstitions originate from? Like how do uh, places that have a strong superstitious tradition, uh, where are all these superstitions coming from? Well, in general, superstitions arise um, as a result of humanity's need to control our environment, right? I mean, the farther back you go, the the more likely it is that that people in general felt like they lived in a world of chaos. You know, mm-hmm. they never knew what was coming. They never knew where it was coming from, um, you know, is are there gods up there hurling boulders on us or are there creatures underground that are trying to, you know, upset us or, or what's happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so originally starting back those um, superstitions, at least in their most basic sense, you know, like, like don't whistle in the dark, you know, the, the basic kind of thing uh, was cautionary. Mm -hmm. Right. They were like, um, if you if you don't want to get eaten by lions, don't do this, <laughs> right? And so they, what starts out as a cautionary admonition, becomes a superstition over time. Particularly as it becomes less likely you'll be eaten by lions, mm-hmm. right? But the but the tradition, the admonition stays with us, and it's just one of those things that our brains as humans are set up to hold on to negative information. Mm. And I mean, you can go into an entire psychological pitch on why that's the case. But um, basically negative information helps us as a species more than positive information does. Mm -hmm. So our brain holds on to those things and it says, Oh, I know that eating, li- getting eaten by lions is bad. 
this guy says he can help me not get eaten by lions. I'm going to listen to him. Right. Yeah. And so that's why those admonitions stay with us, even though the, the reason isn't necessary anymore. You mm -hmm. know, um, don't spill the salt. Well, that's an admonition against wasting what was an incredibly precious resource at one point. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, it's 50 cents a pound in the, mm -hmm. in the grocery store. So <laughs> the admonition doesn't matter, mm -hmm. but the, the caution is still there. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah. it was, it's just fascinating, you know, the way our, our human minds work. And you see superstitions a lot of times in um, sports as well, right? But is that is that something you looked at at all? Actually, I didn't look at it, but what you said is absolutely right. Um, there are p particular groups, athletes are one of them, that are more superstitious than the general public. Mm -hmm. um, off the top of my head, I would say that uh, any kind of performer, if you're talking about actors, if you're talking about dancers, um, musicians, and athletes, all they all, to a certain extent, feel like there's an element of the unknown in their performance. Mm. Is Call it luck, call it providence, call it <laughs> divine intervention, you know, whatever you want to call it, they don't always know exactly why they turn in a great performance mm -hmm. you know they control as much as they can whether that means last time i was great i wore red socks you know i'm gonna wear red socks for the rest of my life mm -hmm. um then that's one way to control it but i don't feel they necessarily believe that it's the red socks Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you see, understand what I'm trying to say. It's like, it's like, um, because, because there's that un undefinable element to an art performance, to a performance of any kind, they're trying to nail down as many different things as they can in the hopes that whatever they put their thumb on will be the magic thing that will make them succeed again this time. Like trying to replicate what they did the last time they were successful in, in, as, in, in as many elements as possible. Yes, exactly. Yes. Because, you know, even though, even if they do replicate all the ones that they think they, they got, they may not have that performance again. Mm-hmm. And we want to think that we can control every single element of our performance, whether it's our body, our car, our dance slippers, our football, whatever it is, if we can control, we should be able to control, you know, it's my body. I should be able to control the way it performs like a machine every mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But of course we're not machines. Right. And so, the the, it, the the problem is it's an illusion. The idea that they can control it is an illusion. So they, we would be happier, they would be happier, perhaps, if they accepted the fact that if you do the same thing over and over again, you're not necessarily going to get the same result. Yeah. And it's just one of those things. <laughs> Did you get a sense of where people are most superstitious? You mentioned that uh, you see that there's a lot of superstition in performers. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about in like in the scope of the world? Is it more rural? Is it more religious? Is it more what are, what do you is there a pattern? There doesn't really seem to be a pattern. I mean, you can you can find groups. Uh, w that are living urban lives and that are living rural lives that are every bit of superstition. Mm -hmm. That said, there are certainly groups around the world who are more superstitious than others. Mm -hmm. um, Google has told me that uh, Nigeria happens to be the most superstitious country in the world. Now, the reasons for that 
there are a lot of them and I don't know them all, but I do know a couple. And one of them is population density. Mm -hmm. And you, you will see that same thing in other high density populations. You will see a lean toward superstitiousness. So if you think about places like um, Brazil, Japan, parts of China, even parts of the U.S., um, you know, high-density cities, the more people you cram into a smaller area, the more we literally and figuratively rub up against each other, the, the more anxious we become, right? right? And what is superstition about? Superstition is about control. So if you have a lot of people who are anxious all the time and there's very little that can be done about it, then all of these ideas will start appearing in society. Mm. The, 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 the ideas like um, don't, don't look somebody in the eye on a Tuesday, you know, or a bird will poop on your head, you know, or, you know, that was, I just made that up. That's not anybody's, that's not anybody's superstition. So don't get upset. Um, but it's that kind of thing that, that the more extreme the situation for people, the more extreme the superstition that will be created as a result. So, mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons Nigeria is very superstitious is because population density, um, cultural factors, and um, a lower income on a worldwide basis. Mm. You know, um, they're, what am I trying to say? They're um, standard of living is what I'm oh. trying to say. Standard yeah. of living, right? So, and that's, that's not, nothing against, you know, whatever their cultural um, biases are, or my cultural biases are, any populations that are in that same situation, again, I point out Japan, I point out South America, um, you're going to experience that kind of elevated rise in superstitious uh, exposition. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and I think if if you look carefully, I think you will find what's happening in the U.S. is very much like the rise of superstition in places that aren't as politically loaded as we are right now. What do you mean? What Can I you mean give us an is. Example? Take a look at um, conspiracy theory. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be general. If you look at the tenets of a lot of conspiracy theories in general, you will see that there is a lot of elements of, of uh, urban legend. There's mm -hmm. a lot of elements of superstition and uh, conspiracy and that kind of thing, like they're, they're out to get us. You start with something basic as that, and immediately people want control, right? They need to control their anxiety. Oh my God, they're out to get us. What can I do? You know? Oh, mm -hmm. oh, I, I can make sure that I don't have a black cat, you know? Or I mm -hmm. can make sure that I don't go to the grocery store on Thursday or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, like the foundation is being laid mm -hmm. for what could be a real big change, mm -hmm. a real big change in yeah. how, how we are as a culture. So let's get into your book. Now you laid it out by continents. Yeah. Um, and you and you start off with Africa. Is there a reason you start off with Africa or is it it wasn't alphabetical, right? It was alphabetical. It was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cuz I think it goes Africa, Asia and Australia. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I saw the Middle East in there, but Middle East is I guess 
it's part of africa yes okay that's how the yeah uh, the publisher like did the the big group breakdown the way i did and then uh -huh. um since they didn't have room for everything they would like take out subsets so egypt is obviously one of those subsets that everyone's going to want to see in mm -hmm. a book like this so okay. that came out as its own subset the middle east came out as its own subset and you'll find that in some of the other groups also Mm hmm. And and I, I noticed that Antarctica is not there. And I realized that nobody actually lives there except for scientists. But I would be curious if scientists <laughs> in Antarctica have some superstitions because, you know, it's so remote and it seems like such a crazy place to live. <laughs> it does Maybe. seem like a crazy place to live. And it's potentially possible they could. On the yeah. other hand, based on the criteria that I set forth. Mm -hmm. um you know crowded mm -hmm. um moderate to low income lowered standard of living and the um i forget what this other one was but since nobody lives in antarctica i don't think they're in danger <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i mean the only thing is the scientists are all locked in together so there could be some anxiety there <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, like they have limited resources, like there's maybe like a doctor or two. And so if like the doctor gets hurt, then I remember seeing some sort of show where someone had to perform surgery on themselves because their, the doctor was passed out or something and they were in dire straits. So I can imagine that there would be situations where it would be very stressful. I'm sure. I'm sure it could be stressful. And, you know, because it is the unknown to a great extent. <laughs> Um, your mind can go anywhere and create anything as far as what a threat might be. Mm -hmm. So yeah. certainly there's going to be, you know, wild creatures in the snow. You know, there's going to be uh, uh, potential uh, earthquakes and, and snowfalls. And, you know, the ground is going to crack open and swallow the whole <laughs> research facility. I mean... <laughs> I'd be out of my mind in a place like that because I, I just have way too many things going on in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't like the cold, so I don't think I'd handle it very well. <laughs> yeah, right there with you. Yeah. Um, okay, so you start with Africa, and you write in the start that Africa remains one of the most mysterious and unknown world to most Westerners. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, and the, the reason why it's it's that mysterious is kind of obvious when you think about it, but I don't think it's obvious otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that mysterious because it is the second largest land mass on the entire planet. Mm. So you have, I mean, that that continent is three times the size three times the size of the United States. Mm. Mm. So if, if anybody wants to see what Africa really looks like, look at a globe because on maps, it doesn't, it doesn't show right. Mm. The way the scale is on a map that South America and North America look a lot bigger than they actually are. Mm -hmm. So on a globe though, that whole, all that land mass will spread out and you'll just, be floored at how enormous Africa is. Wow. So, um, so yeah, it's it it is again the unknown. Just mm -hmm. as we were joking about Antarctica, it is truly the unknown. Um, there's there's there are still parts of Africa that have never been explored. Now, okay. in the modern times, that seems hard to believe. Yeah. but it's actually true. Um, it's not to the extent that it was say a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of places where people have never been mm -hmm. or if they have been, they're still there and we don't know about them. <laughs> you know? Um, like deep in the jungles where people just haven't tried to even get to. Yeah. You know, the impassable places, 
the um, the inaccessible because they're too steep places. The mm. the places where there it's all rocks and no plants and nobody can scramble up these you know the side mm -hmm. of Mount Kilimanjaro. Although people have been up Mount Kilimanjaro, but mm -hmm. I use that metaphorically. You know, it's uh, it's just it's honestly it's mind boggling to me how how much is there. And the other thing is that, yes, there are over a billion people in Africa, but compared to the size of that continent, it's a drop. I mean, there are like 4 billion, something like that in China. Mm -hmm. And it's less than half the size of Africa. So you're, you've got very few people relatively spread out over an enormous area yeah so empty space you know that's that's why it's so mysterious it's empty space mm -hmm. you have clusters of of well-developed highly functional highly uh financially oriented cities and countries um and then you have vast expanses with nothing mm -hmm. so I think it's kind of cool, but it's kind of scary too. <laughs> <laughs> and is that what really makes it unique? What, what would you say makes Africa special and unique in terms of its, I guess, folklore and its, uh, you know, uh, I think in terms of his, of his folklore and, and its um, uh, fables and that sort of thing, uh, it's the number of different civilizations that are there. I mean, Africa is incredibly ancient, right? I mean, Egypt was a high society when the rest of the planet was dust. There was nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I think over, over millennia, whether you go back to the early city-states, Urdu and, and Ur and, and some of those other cities, um, and then through the high dynasties of Egypt and, and through to where they are now, there's just been so much happening on a civilization level. You know, um, there were vast kingdoms. There were uh, huge um, areas that, that nothing but animals roamed. You know, there were... Um, places where uh, civilization was old and there were places where people didn't know there were civilization. There were, there were kingdoms in the southern part of, of Africa, dozens of rich, rich kingdoms ruled by people that were completely their own, um, their own bosses, I guess, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, kings, queens, great dynasties, great civilizations. And then the, the most remarkable thing to me is that a lot of those are still around, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Egypt is still Egypt. You know, they have differences. Obviously, they've got cars and they've got multi-level apartment buildings and, <laughs> and whatnot, but the Nile still floods. You yeah. know, and, and people still drive cattle through the streets. And it's just so much of it, of what was old is still around and is still old. So, mm -hmm. and yet it sits side by side with things that are new and shiny and, and rich. And it's, I can't, can't say enough about it. Yeah. Really. It's just amazing. And so in your book, the way you structure the, each chapter is you look at mythical monsters and then you look at some of the deities, like the gods and goddesses, and then you look at the superstitions. So just depending on how much time we mm -hmm. have, we're going to, I'm just going to ask you to kind of highlight um, a little about, uh, you know, each section, um, if something stuck out to you. Uh, so let's start with mythical monsters. Is there any... Or were there any monsters that you particularly found interesting? Uh, for Africa? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, uh, there's one. I'm gonna see. I'm trying to find my note here. Oh well, the the best known African god. Oh, we're talking monsters. Sorry, I'm talking. It monsters. doesn't matter. You can go with God. <laughs> <laughs> there's one called Mau Mau Mau. Okay. Mamlombo, Mamlombo. I'm so <laughs> sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. Mamlombo. Uh, it's crocodile-like. It's got like the head of a horse and the body of a croc and the neck of a swan. And a lot of these yeah. monsters from all, many cultures tend to be chimeras, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Greek Greek has the same thing. They've got a lot of of manticores and and um, uh, Pegasus and all of these things that are morphed one between the other kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's not that unusual to find thing that has the, the head of a chicken and the tail of a dog and this kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's practically more, if it were just an elephant or, you know, just a giraffe, it mm -hmm. would be less likely to be a great monster. But the thing about Malmout, Malmalalmo, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah anyway the thing about it is that it's 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 great claim to fame is coming up uh and snatching people off the riverbank hmm. okay that seems like a pretty good admonition to anybody that lives an urban life or a rural life in africa right watch out for crocodiles in the river mm-hmm but the thing about this particular one, and I'm using its name specifically because that's what's important, is that in 1990, there was an incident and with a mining company where they were digging for, I forget what, they mine an awful lot of things in Africa. Um, but several employees started disappearing. Mm. And so nobody could figure out why, right? The, the local police force, the mining uh, inspectors, nobody could figure out what was happening to these people. And it kept happening for like, I don't know, eight or 10, 12 days. This kept happening. And finally, they found the bodies um, of the people who had been taken like upriver several miles or something. And they had figured, the, the police figured that a crocodile had taken them, right? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the locals believed that Malmalamo had taken them. And so they had one of their local priests do a ritual to get rid of Malmalamo. Mm -hmm. And after that ritual was performed, the killing stopped. Mm. So that is a good use of of urban legends, urban fables, right? Mm -hmm. Because here you've got a real incident with real physical evidence linked to a myth or a mythical monster, if you will. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Love it. And then I'm assuming there's a superstition that's tied in with that. With the... With the well, monster. the... Is there like a way to avoid that particular monster or is it just don't go near that water? It's not my, in my notes, if, it, if you can avoid Mama Lambo specifically, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the admonition against, you know, getting too close to the edge of the river, particularly yeah. at night could be generalized. Um, they do have a tradition about whistling in the dark mm -hmm. and that is, supposedly is if you if you whistle in the dark you invite evil spirits to come after you at night mm. so you could also kind of link that to your stay away from the riverbanks at night thing mm -hmm. and just just don't don't go out at night just don't do it <laughs> <laughs> and don't taunt <laughs> don't and, taunt yeah, no taunting <laughs> No taunting the evil of crocodiles. Yes. <laughs> well, I can't whistle, so I guess no evil spirits are going to come after me at if I walk at night. <laughs> well, that's good, right? That's fortunate. Yeah. Um, any right. other superstitions that you found particularly interesting in Africa? Well, there are an, a large number of them, uh, particularly coming out of Nigeria, as it happens, mm -hmm. that are about traveling or taking journeys. Okay. Um. 
most of them involve walking um, by foot. And I don't know whether that is currently how most people in Nigeria travel or whether that's something from the past. Mm -hmm. But the, the superstitions involve things like if you, if you are walking and you bump your leg on a log, you have to turn around and go home because it's bad luck. Uh, if you're walking and you trip over a rock and you fall down, you know, you have to turn around and go home and take a bath and then you can start your journey again. You know, they've got half a dozen or more of these kind of travel linked superstitions. And I don't have an explanation for it, uh -huh. particularly since they're, you know, foot travel, which is generally safe. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I mean, unless you're out at night whistling for lions or something and, and they're coming after you, but, um, I don't, I don't know why they have so many. It's just it, kind of fascinating that they do. Yeah. Um, okay. So you talked about Middle East as, uh, obviously Egypt is part of, is, are you considering Egypt as part of the Middle East? Yeah, I am. I am. Okay. The only thing about Egypt is, is that. A lot of, of what we read about Egypt in books isn't doesn't depict what's happened in Egypt currently, right? Because mm -hmm. most of them aren't following the old gods. Just like in Greece, most of them aren't following Zeus and, and Hera. You know, mm -hmm. they're they are following modern Greek Orthodox Church in that case. Right. Uh, in Nigeria, it's whatever church the Nigerians have. I'm sorry, I don't know what church the Nigerians have, but regardless, um, I, in Egypt, I think at least I think in the U S particularly, there's a, this perception that modern Egypt looks exactly like old Egypt. Right. And it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't look the same. It doesn't function the same. Nobody, you know, they use the same language, but mm -hmm. they don't use hieroglyphs. They have, Arabic is their script, you know, so um, I just, I have some reservation uh, about putting forth Egyptian lore, if you will, as though it were still current, mm. you mm -hmm. know. Um, so a lot of this, so a lot of the superstitions or lore you found might or might not still be active for Egypt. That is definitely the case. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I didn't put Greek and Roman gods in this book at all, mm -hmm. because a, everybody studies them in junior high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think everybody knows enough about the Greek and Roman gods that they didn't, we didn't need any more. Um, but I did put Egypt in because A, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And B, I think that it's expected. But I put it in there with the caveat that this is historical mm. and not necessarily current Egypt. Because mm -hmm. yeah, even our movies, you know, show people walking around in, in fezes and, and, uh, and speaking with accent, you know, and think of any mummy movie you've seen in the last 20 years. They all look like that. They all look mm -hmm. like they were cut in the 1920s or the 1820s or anything old. But but anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> One of the, so, so give us a couple superstitions from Egypt then that are probably historical. Um, there's the, there's one concerning the, the Nile, which I'm very sure is historical because obviously that the Nile has been the center of Egyptian, um, agriculture for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So their lives were literally linked to its ebbs and flows. So, mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of, of rituals that were attached to, making sure that the Nile did what it was supposed to do every year. You know, the high priests would do things. There were sacrifices. There were, you know, um, 
competitions like there might be between athletes and things like that. Make it, it was a very festive occasion to make sure that everything was right for the Nile to continue to flood its banks and replenish mm. the earth. Mm. Um, connected to that are, are things like what you have to do on a particular day. Um, one of them was, you know, their, their days, names of days of the week aren't the same as ours, but on the first day of the week, you know, you would, you would have to get up and before the sunrise and make sure you sang the sun up. And then the second day of the week, you would get up with the sunrise and then you would, um, do take a ritual bath and then you would get dressed and you would do your daily activities in the third day, you know, would have its rituals and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, those are, those are technically superstitions, mm -hmm. but for them at the time, they were also religious practices. Right. So, um, and that's the case of, of any mythology, right? Mm -hmm. Mythology by definition is attached to religion, whether mm -hmm. that's in the past or in the present. And that's another reason why I think um, I left Greek and Roman mythology out is because I think we, we have lost sight of the fact that this used to be a civilization's real religion, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's toga parties are not, <laughs> you know, they're, they're just particularly if you're going to talk about this current atmosphere of political correctness, let's not put somebody's religion, whether it's historical or whether it's current in a situation where it looks like it might be being made fun of. You know, mm -hmm. or or pulled apart in a way that is not respectful. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned was the Epic of Gilgamesh, as a very crucial uh, book or text that is from the Middle East. Can you just give us a little idea about what that is? Yes, and that's actually a fascinating book. Um, technically, it's an epic poem. Uh, like Beowulf, mm -hmm. uh, and and like Beowulf, it tells a number of stories. I think Beowulf tells three or four different stories, but um, there are more than that in Gilgamesh. And one of the stories is Gilgamesh slaying a monster that had been rack ransacking a village. Mm. Well, that is essentially the story of Beowulf. Right. So Beowulf <laughs> is taken from Gilgamesh, but most people don't know that. And Gilgamesh is so old. I mean, it's it's it was old when the Egyptians started. So mm. uh, it has influenced almost every major literary work ever written. So you've got Ep Beowulf was inspired by Gilgamesh. There's a story of um, a great war between two civilizations over um, a woman. Yeah. Ah, sounds like Troy to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. Also in Gilgamesh is a recording of a worldwide flood. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so... That obviously is our flood myth. Our, I say, I use the term flood myth because that's how um, mythologists use the term. Mm -hmm. To some people, obviously, it, it is a historical fact. It really happened. And that's fine. I'm not making any judgment over whether that's true or not. In fact, I don't know whether that's true mm -hmm. or not. What I do know is that Almost every civilization on this earth has a flood mythology story. Mm -hmm. Even though our, our religions are very different. Right. We all have this story about the earth being inundated. Now, there have been some interesting speculations about where that 
came from. Mm -hmm. Some scientists want to call it race memory, which is a term that has become out of favor. Um, but what they mean by race memory is, is genetic memory. It's yeah. memory that's handed down in the DNA of humanity. Now, that's an interesting idea because mm -hmm. who would think that, that any kind of event could be handed down in the DNA? That would bring into question, okay, is that, is that why today's generation, um, Gen Z, are so depressed? Mm. Is their race memory 9-11? It's an idea, mm -hmm. you know, is yeah. that modern day proof of race memory or genetic memory? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Don't know, but it's cool. Yeah. It's an, definitely <laughs> an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's go to Asia. What, give us a little background on what makes Asia distinct. Well, it's almost I know I'm, I'm going to offend somebody out there saying this, and, and I don't mean to offend. It's almost like what's going on in Africa, the opposite is going on in Asia. Hmm. In, in Africa, I was talking about how many different civilizations there were and how old their civilization is. In Asia, based on my research, what I have seen happening is that it's very similar civilizations happening over and over again. Like you'll have the Chinese, mm -hmm. you have the Koreans, you have the Nepalese and the Tibetans. Within each of those cultural groups, obviously there are big differences. Mm -hmm. And they see themselves as different. I mean, mm -hmm. as ask Taiwan and China yeah. who, who's the same and who isn't right. Um, but for, as, as an outsider from it with an outside viewpoint, what I can see is that I see almost one giant civilization with small differences mm. versus in Africa. I see, big civilizations with big differences spread over a big area. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I am, I love Asian culture. I love all cultures. That's, that's the truth. That's why I went in what I wrote this bu book, but I am not an expert in Asian culture. Mm -hmm. So I will, I admit that, I'm running the risk of saying, you know, Chinese culture kind of looks like Korean culture kind of looks like Japanese culture. But evidence supports me in that their written languages are very similar. Hmm. Right. So they recently, and then I'm going to say within the last five or six decades, they created a, a, a new writing called CJK, mm -hmm. which literally stands for Chinese, Japanese, Korean. And what it does is that it takes the differences in the three written languages and essentially eliminates them, just throws them out the window. Mm -hmm. And they use this CJK so that they can all communicate effectively because the alphabet is close enough that they can all make each other understood. Interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting. It was very interesting. So, um, and in fact, one of in my, my reference book has, is a bestseller in Korea. Uh, I think probably because I talk about the CJK and, uh, and, and some of those differences and similarities mm. and they, they appreciated, you know, not looking like the odd man out on that one. <laughs> so can you give us a, a few examples of, um, 
superstitions in Asia that you found interesting? There are some really, really interesting things in Asia. Um, when you talk about Hindu superstitions, a lot of them have really practical reasons for being, which not a lot of some of the others, uh, other continents, other cultures don't necessarily. One mm -hmm. of the ones is about hanging a lemon. And the neat thing is that if you hang a lemon, according to the tradition, along with a chili pepper and um, a feather, I think it is, then you won't get sick. Well, mm -hmm. what, the, what has been discovered about that is because it, um, citrus fruits have very high vitamin C. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying, what they said is that they believe that this string that's been run through the lemon um, absorbs lemon juice and vitamin C and it runs up the string and the insects that land on the string get poisoned by the vitamin C in the lemon juice oh. and that it actually kills them. Which I, I, it took me a while to think about that, but I'm like, okay, that could happen. <laughs> All right. So you said you're saying it's lemons and chili peppers. Is that what it is? They're yeah. Combined? Lemon and chili pepper. Yeah. And of course, a lot th those two elements are in a lot of their cuisine. And they're supposed to prevent what? They keep people from getting sick, presumably, mm -hmm. at least according to the dissection. Yeah. Um, by getting rid of insect, you know. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I remember at some point it was really popular to drink like a, a lemon juice, a uh, chili pepper honey drink. Um, and that was intended to keep people from getting sick. It was something that you're supposed to drink every day. And it was, I, I think some people were doing it in fasting um, or some people were doing maple syrup, I believe different variations of mm -hmm. that. So that's interesting. Well, you know, it makes perfect sense based on what we think uh, is going on with the string and the lemon juice. Uh, if you think that those three elements, <clears throat> the chili peppers are going to be good for your heart and your arteries, mm -hmm. the uh, lemon juice good for um, your sinuses, your head, your eyes, your anything else that needs vitamin C. And then um, the sweetener, just make it tolerable. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Who wants to drink it otherwise? Right. right. <laughs> Although there, also, are, there are people who, who argue about, you know, honey having its own uh, health benefits. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say there's a lot of evidence to show that honey um, is used for a lot of remedies. Um, okay. So let's look at we're, we're running low on time um the america so you look at both north and south separately can you just tell us um you know a little bit from each one and maybe a superstition from each one well uh yeah south america has some some interesting things going on because there was uh, a fair amount of immigration from mm -hmm. europe into south america they brought with them a lot of their prejudices, their biases, their superstitions, their everything else. Mm -hmm. So you will find things in South America that you will also find in Europe. For example, uh, don't put your shoes on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Which I don't know why that's a thing, because I don't understand who would put your shoes on the table in the first place. <laughs> but um, but that, that is one um, that's very big in Russia and in Poland is to not do that. Um, there's also one where you, if you, if you're drinking with a party, uh, you know, like a group of friends in a bar, when you're done, you put your bottles on the floor under the table. Uh -huh. And the suspected reason for that is that back in the day, um, when bar keeps, you know, we didn't really know how to run a tab the way we do now. They counted how many bottles you had to charge you how much. 
right. than what you drank, right? Well, I, people thought that maybe if you stuck the bottles under the table, that the bartender wouldn't know how many for sure or would forget to check and, and charge you and you might skate on your bar tab. Yeah. So I kind of like that one. You know, it, it starts out sounding sinister and then it cracks up instead and becomes funny. <laughs> And then you you uh, include the Inuits with the Canadian culture just because of its location, um, geographical location. That's um, correct. Can you, can you give us a little bit of um, a superstition about them and maybe historical? Yeah, actually, um, the Inuit are considered First Nations in Canada. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the biggest reasons that, and as you said, proximity, it was easier to put them up in, in Canada than it was in North America. And they don't belong with us anyway. Their, their cultural uh, practices for their tribes are completely different than um, mm -hmm. Plains tribes and, and North American tribes. So, mm -hmm. um, But one thing that they do have uh, going on is that, of course, they hunt both land and sea animals mm. and most tribes don't at least in in most of north america you're one or the other so one of their uh, admonitions is that you cannot wear the same clothes or use the same weapons to hunt s sea animals versus land animals you have to have mm. separate ones for each uh and a part of that is believed to be it might be like if you're if you kill a polar bear and then the polar bear smell is on your weapons then you're going to scare away the seal see yeah um and vice versa if your seal uh, smell is on your clothes and a polar bear gets wind of you you could be <laughs> the next lunch yeah you know so it makes sense as 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 superstitions sometimes do yeah. It makes sense that how they arose. Exactly. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Europe. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that there's so much variety, th but the original, the variety and originality has disappeared just because of the kind of melding, I guess, of the European nations into kind of a conglomerate. Uh, <laughs> you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Um. I, it hasn't happened in a totality, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you if you go to Hungary and then you go to Poland, you will find that the two of them still have their differences, right? Um, and they still have their individual cultures. I think what I meant was that because people travel across borders with such ease, mm -hmm. and they make their homes, you know, a Hungarian is perfectly welcome to make his home in England if he wants, you know, or, or wherever in Europe or in the Americas, um, because they travel and they bring their culture with them. Certainly you can use America as an example of, of how those cultures get blended, right. right? Nothing is necessarily taken away from that man who happened to come from Poland, but he's going to gain things that he learns from American culture and mm -hmm. American culture will gain from him things he brings. For example, right. often food or um, ways of dress, you know, a hat he might wear, music he might like. That kind of thing makes its way into popular culture. I know I have lots of friends who came from other countries who I can't wait to eat their mama's food. Right. I have a friend whose mother is is Chaldean and she makes the best stuffed vegetables you ever want to taste in your life. <laughs> and uh, I can't wait to get, you know, to her food or or my my friend who is from um, I have a friend from Iran and I have a friend from Australia and they all have their expertise. Yeah, I don't agree with some, all of them, like most of what I see from australia i don't really want to eat <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me about vegemite <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but you know but but you can almost always find something that you like from different cultures and that's what i meant by right. that was that yes there is a certain amount of blending that goes on 
that right. doesn't mean a loss to either culture, right? Nothing is lost from the culture that gave and nothing is lost from the culture that takes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think we all gain by this kind of mixing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you give us a few highlights of uh, some superstitions or folklore from these areas? There is a, um, a general superstition, I think, which applies really well here because you were talking about blending. Mm -hmm. There, the throw a coin in a fountain. Mm -hmm. Many, many, many cultures have that superstition, partly mm -hmm. due to travel, merchant travel, you know, from over eons of time, and partly due to movies we've watched or, you know, habits our families have or whatever that may be. But using that as an example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to isolate it to India because I'm most familiar with it in that setting. Mm -hmm. In India, it's tradition to throw coins in the fountain for various reasons. Um, you do it on uh, to give the bride and the groom good luck. You do it to ensure a safe journey. You do it to, um, you know, have healthy cattle or whatever your, your thing is. It's, it's a very much a part of the culture in India particularly. So in antiquity, a lot of coins were made of zinc and copper. Mm -hmm. We know now, based on modern food science, that zinc and copper are two very, very important nutrients for human beings to consume. By throwing those coins in that fountain, that water source then became laden with zinc and copper and other metals that were beneficial to the people who drank from the well. Yeah. It helped strengthen their immune systems. It helped keep the water clear because it it killed microbes and algaes and different insects in the water. I mean, it had a, a number of benefits and it was all, it was based on something that people didn't even notice immediately. Yeah. Right. It's like somewhere over time, people came to realize that it really was, you did have good fortune when you threw mm -hmm. money in the water, you may not know why back then, but you knew that it, you just felt better. Things went better for you. You know, things were, <laughs> it was all good. And I'd imagine and, the reverse is true. If you take money from the, the, the fountain. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you know, in antiquity, you could get your hands cut off for doing that. Wow. Um, now obviously we wouldn't do that nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> but at, in fact, hotels pay some guy to go in there and take all the money out of the fountain, you know, yeah. so that, it, that people can keep throwing money into it. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you talk about a, a serious, uh, something that would make you not want to do something would be, yeah, you touch, <laughs> touch those coins and lose your hand. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so our last continent is Australia, Oceania. I guess some people call it Oceania and some people call it Australia. Can you give us um, a superstition or highlight a, a folklore element from Australia? Um, Australia, Oceania is actually the term for all of the islands and archipelagos that are around Australia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like New Zealand, Tasmania, you know, Fiji, all of those kind of things. Right. It's those isolated um, islands and whatnot that don't have a country to call home of their <laughs> own. Right. So if if Moana had a country, it would be Oceania. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, Australia itself isn't Oceania. But okay. um, there are some... And interesting things going on in, in Australia. And one of them is you, you may or not know, may or may not know that there are a number of reptiles <laughs> in Australia. Uh, it, it's kind of, it's kind of just crawling, pardon the pun with them. 
and um and and in particular one of the ones is a gecko now we all know the geico gecko um <laughs> and so so he's he's not not a big mystery to most of us here in this country at least but if you you cannot kill a gecko in australia or in india for that matter either but uh it's because it's terrible luck it's bad luck mm -hmm. And the main reason, of course, now people won't say it's bad luck because, because most people don't know why it's bad luck, but it's bad mm -hmm. luck because geckos eat a lot of insects, including a lot of them that are very destructive. A lot of them that are bad, you know, like mosquitoes, they make people mm -hmm. ill. They potentially has lay, you know, all kinds of eggs and do destructive things. And they were, um, they took care of the of the larvae of the um whatever ate the silkworms i apologize i don't remember what ate the silkworms in oh, australia no. but they were having a big problem uh, with the decimation of the silkworms that made the silk crop and uh, finally they were able to get that under control with geckos so i need geckos my backyard is crawling with mosquitoes. <laughs> you know, most good reptile stores nowadays sell them. They're kind of cute with their little round feet and the five toes and yeah. all that. But, but something you may or may not know on a, on, a, on a closing note is that geckos do not have eyelids. Their mm. eyeballs stay open all the time. Mm. So they lick their eyeballs to keep <laughs> them clean and... <laughs> And moist. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see him going mount, mount. <laughs> and was there a superstition with that? Didn't I say don't kill a gecko? Oh, don't kill a gecko. That's right. That was at the very beginning. <laughs> I got <laughs> lost. <laughs> I got lost in the part. <laughs> I got lost in imagining my backyard mosquito free with geckos running around. <laughs> and then I threw you with the eyeball looking thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a perfect way to end. So tell us um, any lasting thoughts, anything that you feel like we didn't touch on. Oh, well, honestly, through no fault of yours, there's a lot that uh, we could have covered if if I'd have been a little bit better organized. But um, I think the most important thing is that I th this book is a great place to start if you don't know where to start. Um, but there are tons of sources out there of places you can go in depth. Mm -hmm. I'm actually working on a part two to this book uh, that won't be out until sometime next year. But, um, since this covers, you know, the major continents and land masses of the world, you're in pretty good shape with this book. And, uh, and I hope that some of you enjoy it. And what will book two, will it just be like a continuation of these same places or will you add in different countries? What, what's the book two intended to do? Well, what's happening in book two is that it's going to lean more into superstition and less into like fables and monsters and stuff. Okay. Um, and it's going to be arranged such that it's going to be around like the subject of the superstition. For example, um, cats, you know, superstitions about cats or no. superstitions about um, money or mm -hmm. superstitions about, you know, rain or whatever. So it'll be arranged differently. And not, you know, uh, break broken down into uh, cultural distinctions like this one. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that because this was such a fascinating uh, read. And I definitely recommend anyone uh, who's interested in this subject matter uh, take a look. It, she has it. It's an ebook as well as a physical book, but it is very beautifully um, designed. So, it, it, like she said, it would be a, a great coffee table edition for anyone. Hint, hint for Christmas, right? Right, absolutely. <laughs> and Amazon has it on sale right now. Perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Deborah, for joining us today. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm I really liked being here.
And thank you, folksy folks, for joining us on the superstitious journey. Uh, what are your funny superstitions? Everything that um, all the links, I think we will just link uh, her book on our website, fabricoffolklore.com. And I would encourage everyone to subscribe and share. Send it to your friend who, like Serena Williams, wears the same pair of socks throughout an entire tournament for good luck. Uh, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. And on X, uh, previously Twitter, uh, thanks for unraveling the mysteries of folklore on Fabric of Folklore. Once again, I'm Vanessa Y. Rogers. And until next time, keep the folk alive.